Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. Uh, it is Thursday, February 25th, and we are working on a proposed committee bill uh, regarding hate motivated crimes. Uh, this is something that actually this committee talked about. I think it's been for a few years we've been we've been discussing this. And so I'm going to turn over uh, this over to uh, Representative Martin Lalonde, who can give us some background um, in absence of counsel. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The, it's a fairly straightforward bill, and uh, in past trienniums, we've uh, looked at this particular uh, uh, crime. It's actually it's actually an enhancement. Uh, well, it's not an individual crime itself, uh, but leads to an enhancement of an underlying crime. Uh, but uh, there, we did look at some various things that we were trying to do, and uh, never really quite cross the finish line because we were trying to do much more than what this simple uh, amendment really accomplishes. Uh, and, and this is an area that I think that we've already learned a little bit. We have to be very careful uh, because of First Amendment concerns and such. But the, the, uh, the amendment that is proposed in this committee bill, uh, from what I understand, we can hear from uh, various um, to, uh, witnesses, does not, does not raise a First Amendment uh, concern. It's consistent with what other states uh, have done. But essentially, it's removing one word, and that's maliciously. And so for hate-motivated crime, it provides that a person who commits causes to be committed or attempts to commit any crime and whose conduct is maliciously motivated by the victim's actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, ancestry, age, service in the US Armed Forces, disability, uh, sexual orientation, or gender identity shall be subject to the following penalties. And then the, the part that's not in front of you right now is what those additional uh, penalties would be uh, if the underlying crime was motivated by hate. Um, the bottom line is that maliciously is just really not needed. It, it uh, also sets the bar higher than necessary. Uh, if one's conduct, uh, if, a, if a, a, an assault, for instance, is motivated by one of these factors of a victim, uh, I, really the idea is that you do not need to go to the next step of trying to prove that somehow it was also malicious. I think almost by definition, uh, if, if uh, a, a conduct that leads to an offense, such as an assault, for instance, uh, if it's motivated by one of those factors, uh, it, it by, almost by definition is, is certainly uh, could be considered malicious. But it's, not, it's just simply a, a word that uh, potentially adds an extra heightened element that is really not necessary. At least that's the thought behind this. And, and it's really the same concept for the second section that also strikes the word maliciously uh, relating to the burning of a cross or other religious symbols. Once again, if somebody intentionally sets fire to or burns causes to be burned, etc., cetera, a cross or a religious uh, symbol with the intention of terrorizing or harassing a particular person or persons, shall be subject to uh, imprisonment of not more than two years or a fine of not more than $5,000. So that's not even, it's not an enhancement, that's an actual offense itself. But once again, adding an extra element of having to try to prove not only intentionality, uh, but maliciousness, particularly when you further on in that crime, it talks about an intention of terrorizing or harassing. Uh, why, why does one need to have that additional uh, term of maliciously. So that's what it does. Fair, fairly straightforward, at least on its face, but we'll see what witnesses think. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate you doing that. Uh, questions? Uh, Ken. Uh, I probably missed this, but why is that word still in line six? Or is that where it's supposed to be? That, well, that, that's just a, an explanation of what the bill does. It's saying the bill proposes to amend the hate motivated crime statute, okay. eliminate that word. Got, gotcha, just thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm not 
not seeing any other hands. So I'd like to welcome Susanna Davis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, um, thank you all for having me. Uh, I'm Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. And um, I don't have a whole lot to add here. Uh, I suppose I'll say very, um, just to summarize, this is a move that, um, that the Racial Equity Task Force has put forth as a recommendation in its most recent report. Um, so it's something that certainly the task force stands by. Uh, actually, I'm going to be adding into the chat now the list of related recommendations that the task force has made regarding hate crimes and, and bias motivated uh, behaviors. I'll also uh, just read them out loud quickly for those unable to access the chat, members or viewers. Those are declaring racism a public health epidemic, supporting legislation to mandate hate crimes reporting and uniformity in that reporting across agencies, supporting legislation to add confidentiality provisions for complainants in attorney general's office civil investigations, supporting legislation to allow the attorney general's office to seek compensatory damages on behalf of victims, supporting legislation to review the malicious motivation standard for hate crimes, that's the one that you all are, are proposing, and increasing funding for the Human Rights Commission to add capacity so that the commission can uh, receive and address complaints more and more effectively. So this uh, proposed bill is certainly one that the task force has deliberated on and does support. Um, the backstory, and I think the representative um, summarized it very well, so I don't wanna, oh, Oh dear, I seem to have gotten kicked off the call, but I think you can still hear me. Yep, we hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I think the representative summarized it well, so I don't wanna be redundant, but um, the thing about the malicious motivation standard is that it is a high burden to reach. And oftentimes we have bad actors who know exactly the level of conduct that they're allowed to get away with, if you will, so that they don't trigger the enhancement of hate crime or bias motivated crime in their behavior. This allows people to fly under the radar and to feel emboldened to behave in ways that we consider socially, morally, and ethically reprehensible, but which unfortunately don't rise to the level that we can actually do something about it. In some cases, um, we have entities in the state like the AGO who uh, are empowered to investigate certain kinds of complaints but that power is limited in ways that we could consider expanding. For example, we know that the HRC is empowered, does have the authority to seek compensatory damages on behalf of people who are discriminated against based on their membership of one or more protected categories. Curiously, AGO's office does not, well, AGO does not uh, have similar authority to seek compensatory damages on behalf of victims, which sometimes contributes to cases, behaviors, or just general incidents going unanswered effectively, um, or at least uh, folks not being made whole or as close to whole as they can be because of that limitation. There are a number of other issues that the task force also raised in its September, excuse me, in its January report around this issue, things that we didn't quite come to consensus on or that we still had open questions about that are related to this topic. That includes, um, that includes things like subpoena power. It includes um, certain elements of discovery during civil investigations for hate crimes, et cetera. These are things that if reviewed could give us more opportunity to discover information, to identify actors who are engaging in um, hate or bias motivated behavior. But again, these are things that we need a little bit further um, discussion. And of course, I don't want to um, swim in, in AGO's lane on this one because they're much more versed on this than, than we are. So I think I'll just close by saying that um, generally, this is a bill that we support. It is also in line with other recommendations that we've made about um, revising the standard of severe and pervasive when it comes to harassment bullying and discrimination, both in schools and in places of public accommodation. The link between those recommendations are, is that we have acknowledged that the burdens of proof remain very high, and yet the conduct does not appear to be waning. And part of the reason for that is because there are lots of 
types of behavior that are still permissible under the law, though we find them abhorrent. And so bringing policy and bringing law more in line with um, the values that we are continuing to evolve as a society uh, will allow us to have a better um, ability to, to tackle some of these issues. I do also want to say that I don't think this is necessarily the end all be all. I don't think that um, creating or prosecuting more hate crimes is the goal. It's certainly a tool in our toolbox that we can use, but of course the goal is reducing the, in the incidence um, of these kinds of behaviors and also empowering people to come forward and be able to report. And that's gonna require a lot more of us than the technical changes like the ones we're proposing. It's also going to require that we create an environment that pe where people feel safe being able to approach us. And oftentimes that happens primarily at the local level where people go to a local police station. And so in many ways, this certainly is statewide, but also is gonna require that we engage with municipalities more, particularly in policing and investigation, so that they understand that they play a huge, huge role in the intake for uh, complainants or potential complainants on these issues. Not only that, um, it also requires that we follow through when we do receive complaints or when we do take up cases. Uh, there are some times that people really experience a chilling effect not wanting to bring a case because even if a case is acknowledged as a hate crime or a bias motivated incident, and even if it's taken up, if they feel that they're not going to get um, a, a, a fair shot at justice, then that can be enough to deter people just to see themselves splattered across the headlines for a few months, get more backlash and retribution, and then nothing. So it requires a lot more um, real change from us as a state and as a collection of municipalities. But I, I, I do think, I'm just speaking on behalf of the task force here, um, that this is a, a good start and that it can be very useful in helping to expand the protections that we offer for people who currently fall between the cracks based on the wording of law. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. That was very helpful. And I also, um, Appreciate you putting up in the um, chat the recommendations. And I'm hoping on this committee bill, we talked about this yesterday, that we do have something regarding reporting um, of, of crimes. We, we know that that is a, a big issue. So, um, so thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, I see Martin's hand is up. Yeah, I, I did have one question, but this also just one <clears throat> quick comment. Uh, really appreciate your testimony and appreciate the task force's reports as well. Uh, I'll ask my question first, and that is, uh, I assume that these, these uh, the list that you just provided us are from both the September and the January task force uh, reports, is that correct? I just wanna make sure these I know actually, where to find it. Yeah, these actually, and I'll put links to both reports in the chat, um, but these actually only appear in the January report. Okay, all right, so the, the other thing is that, you know, we, we talk about, uh, vehicles uh, for getting uh, good policy through. And, and this particular bill seemed to be kind of low hanging fruit. And, and uh, as I mentioned before, I've, I've worked on a, a more expansive version in the past and just didn't manage to get it moving. But I think the idea is certainly to keep this one pretty straightforward. And I do know that there's going to be a bill coming out that uh, includes a number of the governor's recommendations on the social racial equity front. And that may be a vehicle for some of these additional uh, issues or additional uh, recommendations. That's one thing. The other is I really do appreciate the emphasis on uh, education and those kind of things that were in the report. Cause I think you're right. Uh, changing it to malicious is an important step but that's not really where we should be focusing our efforts to, to prevent these kind of situations. So I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Representative. I guess I just have one more thing to add. Um, you know, this, this is, it's a difficult topic, I think, for a lot of us, um, because there are certain policies that we identify that we think could substantially move the needle on, on equity and on hate incidents. And yet, we also are, are limited by, um, for, for one thing, constitutional protections, um, and, and it's difficult. And I know, I mean, on the task force, we have three attorneys. And so it's, there's something that feels very wrong about saying, let's curtail people's behavior. And that's not really where we're trying to go with this, right? Because of a deep 
reverence and respect for civil liberties. Um, so it really is so much about finding a balance between protecting people who are vulnerable to being attacked versus, um, you know, also preserving very important but often misused um, legal guarantees. And I don't, I don't pretend that we've gotten it 100% perfect, but I think that it's just really important to keep all of that in mind, that none of these recommendations, I think, um, come lightly. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay, great. Uh, Rebecca Turner, Defender General's Office, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner, head of the Appellate Division of the Office of Defender General. Um, so, and I, I missed the draft number, but for the record, I wanted to share um, that the Defender General's Office does not support this bill, but more importantly, to share the reasons why we cannot support it. And there are two primary reasons why we can't support it. Uh, the first uh, are the constitutional problems that come up. And I, uh, in all due respect to Representative Lalonde, uh, talking about how the language of 1455, the hate crimes uh, statute, does not violate the First Amendment. Um, as recently as 2018, I litigated a case before the Vermont Supreme Court, State v. Shank, challenging the facial validity and as applied of this statute, even without the proposed amendment, which um, as the intro walkthrough confirmed, makes it easier and therefore broadens the, the potential protected speech captured, therefore just exacerbating the First Amendment problems. So I wanted to put that on the committee's radar. Uh, when I looked at the second part of this bill, I actually didn't realize we had a statute on the books relating to burning of crosses, 1456. Again, the problem there is that the statute already violates uh, the First Amendment. It already falls below the US Supreme Court standards set out in Virginia v. Black in 2003. The removal of yet another uh, requirement maliciously doesn't help that situation. So that is the first and primary reasons why uh, this proposal is, is a problem. Moving to the second uh, reason why we don't support this bill uh, concerns sentencing goal problems. Now, as Representative Lalonde highlighted, this is not a hate crime offense in of itself, right? It is a statute that permits enhancement, sentencing enhancement, uh, where the underlying uh, elements are proven. And so what that means is that every underlying offense where there's an alleged hateful act is already subject to criminal penalties, right? So this is not escaping any criminal offense. It's just whether or not, and effectively by dropping uh, the word maliciously, it widens the road, right? To make it easier to impose longer incarcerative sentences. So this, this essentially establishes that longer sentences to imprisonment may be imposed. And I think then the question comes back to this committee is what is the goal that is trying to be achieved by that, by making it easier to impose longer sentences to imprisonment? As we heard from Susanna Davis, I certainly think that's a very valid reason to try to uh, craft legislation, which is presumably one of the purposes is to protect um, particular communities from being targeted from hate motivated crimes. If that is the goal to protect particular communities from hate based crimes, what we know, and we discussed this earlier this week in the context of H87 and the proposal of increasing fines, we know that the studies clearly show that deterrence and rehabilitation are not achieved by increasing the severity of penalties. It, 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 that is not in question anymore. We know that the certainty of punishment does that. So again, does increasing penalties to imprisonment solve this? Does it deter people from committing these crimes? 
If it doesn't, and that's what the sh studies show, again, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, punishment relating to hate. The point is, is, if the severity of the penalties increase, will it deter? I think the studies show us that no, it will not. So then the question is, well, can someone who commits these if, if proven hateful based motivated crimes, can they be rehabilitated while sitting in jail? Will they come out less racist, less bigoted, less homophobic? I think that I haven't seen any studies that, that support that. Um, so again, I question what are the goals um, being achieved by this? And again, it complements what, what Susanna Davis shared. Um, and certainly from my experience on the racial disparities advisory panel, and I've been a member of that panel since its inception. Uh, and I was going through the reports, the 2019 report that was submitted to the legislature from RDAP. And in that report and in subsequent reports relating to data, it does not include a recommendation that the legislature take on, broaden the hate crime statute. And there is a reason for that. Uh, the reasons that I shared just now, uh, and I think that there's been a recognition that there are more effective means to address this problem. And what are those other means? I defer to RDAP's 2019 report where it laid it out. Um, so I think that that is all I wanted to share with this committee um, this afternoon. If there are any questions, I'll pause here. Thank you. Questions? Martin. Yeah, just a couple questions. Yeah, um, the State v. Schenck case, uh, I know I mean, I'm not I'm not in a position to or, or wouldn't want to argue about what it means one way or another, but it's just that I know that when I looked at this a couple of years ago, I'm pretty sure that that case was already out, but I'm trying to, what was the date of that case? Uh, it's a 2018 decision. I don't have the exact site. Yeah, no, that's and that's fine. Actually, I, I I'm looking to download it anyway. But right. but but at that time, at least we didn't. You know, when I was this, when I was working on this bill, or or a version of this a couple of years ago, and I thought it was after State v. Shank, uh, the issue of removing maliciousness, and I was talking to the AG's office, and we'll have them testify and such. Uh, that that wasn't the issue. Removing maliciousness wasn't an issue that that uh, they didn't think that was problematic. But maybe I'm misremembering, and we'll have to revisit it. But um, so I guess it wasn't really a question. The main question was what what was the data on that. Uh, but I, but I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate what you're saying as far as you know what is the purpose of of uh, the underlying purpose. I think it's certainly making a, a, state, a statement as far as where our, our morals are and, and what we think is really uh, reprehensible behavior. Uh, but yeah, that's, you make very good points and we certainly have to take that into consideration as we're looking at this. So I, I appreciate your testimony, Rebecca, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing any other hands. Yeah. No. Thank you. Okay, uh, James Pepper, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Uh, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, the department is in support of this legislation. Um, we have held uh, in the past and continue to believe that the word maliciously is not necessary. We're actually in a minority of states that require a showing of maliciousness or malice. Um, I think there's nine others. Uh, a much more common approach um, is to show that a crime was motivated by racial animus or because of or by reason of a victim's characteristics. So no requirement of uh, malice or maliciousness. Um, we think that this is a better approach. Um, as the US Supreme Court has noted, um, victim selection based on bias, whether it's by malice or just because of, uh, or any other modifier, or none, none at all, inflicts a greater harm on society than non-biased motivated crimes. Um, you know, it can cause marginalized communities to feel targeted and intimidated. It can provoke retaliatory crimes and it can incite community unrest. 
do we really care that a defendant had a specific ill will or malice against a particular group um, when they selected a victim based on that characteristic? I mean, you could imagine a defense that focuses on attacking malice, um, where a defendant would argue that um, he or she committed this crime um, not because of any sort of malice against you know, a marginalized community, but because of a genuinely held belief that, for instance, um, you know, white people are superior to black people and they can do whatever they want. You know, that that's you know, that would be a attack on a, a defense based uh, on you know trying to undermine malice. So it, it doesn't, it's not necessary. The Shank case um, did I don't believe changed that. I know um, Rebecca argued it, but I, the the ruling there never reached the question of um, the first or 14th amendment challenges to uh, the hate crime statute. And um, we've supported this in the past and we think that it's uh, an important piece of legislation. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, questions? No. I'm not seeing any hands at this point. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Pepper. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, see, so we have Amanda. I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Garces. 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 Great. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, I'm going to be really brief because Susana already shared a lot about um, what uh, some of the the report and some of what we see, but we do wanna just make sure that, I, I wanted to introduce me first because I, it's my first time here. And um, so my name is Amanda Garces. I am the Director of Policy, Education um, and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And uh, our mission is to promote full civil rights in Vermont. Um, the commission protects people from all of all discrimination in housing, state government employment and places of public accommodation. And we do that through um, investigations, conciliations, and litigation. Uh, we provide education and outreach. That's part of my job to work with the communities on the ground for their needs. And our protected categories are women, children, people who are black or different people of color, new Americans, persons with disabilities, and members from the LGBTIQA community. So we are here to support um, the statute change, um, but we wanna, you know, echo some of what Susanna said, but also we are just make, knowing that this is not our jurisdiction. This is really the Attorney General's office and um, we would like to defer to them since they are the ones that investigate this type of crimes. Um, so I just, yeah, I just wanted to say that I believe any changes, we believe at the HRC that we support this and given the rise on hate and bias in our, in our country, these days, you know, we've seen the rise in uh, xenophobia and racism against Asian Americans, and uh, we really want to see to make sure that you know things are strengthened to give the people's the voice that they need. So I just wanted to be short um, and not make you listen to me because I'm echoing what Susanna already told you in her brilliant ways. Well, well, thank you. And you can take as, as much time as you like. Please don't feel like you have to rush or, or be short. short. It's, it's always good to hear from, from many voices. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So make sure there aren't any questions. Um, not seeing any hands. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So that is our testimony on the committee bill. So, you know, Put this aside for now, and um, we have a little bit of time. We'll, um, oh, I'm sorry, Kate. I see your your hand is up. <laughs> Wait, and on the on mute. Um, thank you. Sorry, it's a last minute question. Um, so we just heard testimony, and I, I don't know uh, if it, who exactly this would be directed to, but um, maybe Amanda or Susanna, if, she, oh, if she's still here. But so we just heard testimony from the Defender General's Office. Um, expressing some concern that making this kind of change would actually potentially sort of perpetuate inequitable outcomes in the criminal justice system. 
And I guess I'm just curious to hear from those who are testifying um, in support uh, who tend to represent folks who are within more marginalized communities, just what your perspective is on that take. Susanna, sure. Um, actually, who we can certainly hear from more than more than one person. Susanna, do you want to start, and then we can hear from Amanda? Oh, can't hear you. Mm -hmm. How about now? Uh, yeah, I, I can start um, and say a little bit about that. I'm, I'm glad that that was raised because I don't think that these concerns are mutually exclusive. We know, for example, that people of color, people um, experiencing poverty, people from other marginalized communities are often overcharged, over incarcerated and treated more harshly in general by the justice system. And so enhancements and crime enhancements tend to be things that justice advocates tend to oppose for precisely those reasons. They're often used much more heavy handedly against the kinds of populations who we're trying to protect. Um, so yeah, I think that that is an important concern and it's one that we should be tackling simultaneously with the rise in hate crimes and, and bias motivated incidents. I think that there's a lot of focus and I have these conversations on, on in my personal life as well with, with folks close to me. Um, there's a lot of conversations about how can we punish more? How can we enhance more? And, you know, I, again, I came here speaking on behalf of the task force and this is something that we support, but I do just want to stress again that this shouldn't be the only tool in our toolbox because it relies, first of all, on a downstream process, which is punishment after something has happened. Um, or investigation after something has happened. And because, it, but it doesn't really get at the upstream factor, which is a person's motivation to act in this way. Um, I also note that our society is changing rapidly. And so our definitions of bias have also changed rapidly. And I wanna make sure that our law is not overly heavy handed. Um, so yeah, I would say that I, I share those concerns precisely because um, outcomes for criminal defendants tend to be worse for people of color and other marginalized groups. But um, I think we can, I think we can do our best to address both sides of that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Amanda, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I, 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 I think we do want to make sure that we're deferring to the attorney general because they are the ones investigating and they are the ones that see the full scope. Um, so on, on that front, I, I I don't think I have any further comments than that. Thank you. Any of our other witnesses wanted to weigh in? Okay, great. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to turn now to uh, the request from the House um, Corrections Committee. Um, I realize we are going over time. I'm sorry, I didn't realize we'd be on the floor so long, but let's see. Um, let's go until four o'clock and see where we are. Uh, I know we have some witnesses that are not coming. So, um, Sarah Robinson, let's start with you. Here you go. Here you are. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. It's good to, good to see you all. Um, so thank you for the invitation to testify today on the um, section eight of the House Corrections and Institutions Committee bill that they are currently working on. We testified over there this morning. Um, but because corrections related issues uh, tend to happen in the House Corrections and Institutions Committee, I just wanted to take one moment to share why the network has a longstanding commitment to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women in Vermont. Um, for nearly two decades, we have operated the DIVAS program. It's an acronym that stands for Discussing Intimate Violence and Accessing Support. And that operates out of the Women's Correctional Facility, both in the current location and in previous locations where the women's facility was located. And DIVAS provides in-person trauma-informed advocacy to women at CRCF who identify themselves as victims of domestic and sexual violence. I would just note that the overwhelming majority of incarcerated women have experienced some form of abuse, often um, sexual violence or domestic violence, which really links 
the violence in women's lives uh, to their entry into the criminal justice system as defendants. And we were closely involved with the Downs Racklin Martin investigation and provided several interviews to the investigators, our on the ground team and our um, organizational team. And we also organized a focus group for the investigators with other organizations that are contracted to provide services at CRCF. We're not surprised by the report findings. They largely mirror our observation that there is a deep and longstanding cultural problem with sexual misconduct at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. And that will require a long-term and multifaceted solution, not just one thing. Um, but in regards to section eight that this committee is looking at today, the seven day story that began this conversation or renewed this conversation again, highlighted uh, recent sexual misconduct at CRCF with people who uh, were or are incarcerated there and among those recently re released. And it really highlighted the importance of this proposed change that you're looking at today. Even if an inmate parolee or probationer is not under the current direct supervision of a Department of Corrections employee or contractor. A sexual relationship between a person that was formerly incarcerated or supervised and a DOC employee or contractor in our estimation is still defined by an insurmountable power differential that often involves coercion. And while we believe that the cultural issues highlighted in the Downs Racklin Martin report certainly require multiple strategies to address sexual misconduct, this is one important step, this expansion, and, and we support the proposal. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kate, is your hand up from before, or do you have a question for Sarah? Four. Great. Okay. Um, I'm all set. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Tom. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd like to hear that explanation again, because I, uh, Sarah. So I think I'm pretty sure what I heard was that once somebody is, say, released from prison and out on their own and back to their life, that this could still apply. So the the proposal is that the individual does not need to be under the direct supervision of the Dep Department of Corrections employee for there to be a criminal act. Um, and that a Department of Corrections employee um, does, yeah, does not need to be directly supervising that individual for that to be a problematic behavior. And in some of the cases that were highlighted in the Seven Days article, for example, um, individuals were former correct were, were correctional officers who had supervised um, inmates while they were in the facility and then those inmates were released. They were being supervised by a different DOC employee, but those correctional officers were engaging in sexual misconduct with the released inmates. So they didn't have a formal supervision relationship, but they had formerly uh, overseen them at the facility. And so this proposal will um, would expand the prohibition on um, sexual relationships between DOC employees and contractors um, and individuals under DOC supervision. Okay, I, I can appreciate that. Um, but it, it wouldn't, uh, for somebody who's been released and they weren't under any kind of supervision, it wouldn't apply to them though, would it? That is my understanding, correct. Okay, okay, that was, that was my fear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, AJ Rubin, I know you're um, juggling. Is a good time for you? Yes. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. My name is AJ Rubin from Disability Rights Vermont. I'm a supervising attorney there. We do a substantial amount of uh, work within the prisons being the federally authorized protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities, as well as the state's mental health ombudsman. Uh, my staff are some of the few people who have uh, federal authority to go inside of prisons and, and talk to prisoners uh, with disabilities, which is a lot of the prison population. So on section eight, um, 
I've polled my staff uh, about um, the impact of this on our clients, and um, we do not see any negative impact on our clients from going forward with expanding the prohibition uh, to, as Sarah said, uh, folks who are still under the supervision of the department, but not necessarily under the supervision of a specific individual. Um, and so um, we have no objection to that. And we think that uh, these are all very important steps to take to protect uh, prisoners and the community at large. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you for inviting me to speak. Great, thank you. That's, that's, that's helpful, that's great. Uh, let me just give committee members an opportunity to raise their hands. Not seeing any. <laughs> great, well, thank you. Thank you for being available, appreciate it. Okay. Good luck with all you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, Ashley, you miss here. Great. Hello. Ashley, Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for, for inviting me and having me. I appreciate the time uh, and the attention to this matter. In regards to Section 8 of the draft bill, um, first of all, let me uh, introduce myself and my organization. I'm, I'm currently the executive director of the Women's Justice and Freedom Initiative. Um, which was really a nonprofit that we founded to lift up the voices of directly impacted folks. Uh, we've done a lot of work as well, uh, as Sarah Robinson mentioned, uh, with the folks at CRCF. I spent a month uh, on the ground in that facility with the staff and the incarcerated uh, folks at CRCF in the aftermath of, of the article uh, that Paul Hines wrote in December of 2019. We, uh, myself, was involved uh, in almost every aspect of the independent investigation and since uh, the work around the recommendations and the report itself. I am also a formerly incarcerated woman at that facility um, and hold many relationships with the people still there and, and formerly incarcerated there. Um, my comments about Section 8 is, is while I as well support the intention, I do have concerns. Uh, about the impact for um, more in section two where it talks about for people being supervised uh, in the community. I think that this language is incredibly vague. It simply says, um, if you are a contractor, employee, contractor, or other person providing services to offenders on behalf of the Department of Corrections or pursuant to a court order, uh, and it lists out the different levels of community supervision, uh, shall in, it essentially just says shall engage in a sexual act with a person is prohibited. My concern becomes, uh, I'm going to take my own personal example. So I'm currently married to someone who is on parole. So community supervision sentences can be many years. They can look very different. They can be for uh, many different charge types. So my concern becomes if I were to then be a contractor of corrections, I'm currently not, but I do an immense amount of work with them. And I am then married to someone who is under supervision. I think this language is too vague. I think this language is trying, I, I, I think this section is trying to address that power differential that you heard Sarah speak about. I think that the intention is good. And I also can see from someone who's been on supervision, someone who is married to a person who is on supervision and does work with corrections how there is a piece of this that we're not uh, addressing. And so I have some concerns about being more intentional and specific with the language uh, to address a situation like my own marriage. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for your work. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, uh, Ken. What section did you, did you say um, that paragraph number two, is that what you were talking about? Or section two, I should say? So under section eight, it says, A, uh, no correctional employee, contractor, or other person providing services to offenders on behalf of the Department of Correction or pursuant to a court order in accordance with a condition of parole, probation, supervised community sentence, or furlough shall engage in a sexual act with a person who the employee, contractor, or other person providing services knows, and then their section one is confined to a correctional facility or underneath that there's subcategory two, 
which says is being supervised by the Department of Corrections while on parole, probation, supervised community sentence or furlough. And that you were focusing mainly on the section two part or the whole thing? Well, I'm concerned that it simply says shall engage in a sexual act. And I'm concerned with folks who are on supervision. So we're talking about 5,000 people who are under supervision of corrections at any given time. And then we're thinking about corrections and contractors and folks that do work with uh, corrections supervised people being, it's one of the largest employers in some communities, right? And so I'm thinking about the relationships that are not part of the coercion that we are, we're talking about in the report that we're talking about in the recommendations, the exploitation, the harassment, the sexual assault. But what about the people, like I used my own example, I could become a contractor of corrections. My organization very well could. We work with them every single day. So someday we might, but I am also married to somebody who is currently under supervision of corrections. So this would make me subject to this language. It, it, it yeah. does not address at all any sort of like healthy, successful, safe relationships either. That is my concern. Yeah, I, I was fine with, I was just trying to, I thought you went right to two and I went to two and then <laughs> I was backing up. So it's, we're good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Barbara, Coach and Kate, and I'm sorry if I'm not um, calling on you and, and then Selena um, in the order that you, that your hands went up. Hi, Ashley. I, I have a feel. Oh, I'm, I'm not on mute. Okay. I thought it was. Um, I have a feeling that you may have just addressed my question with the answer you gave to Ken, but um, I was concerned to make sure contractors were in there because I was thinking in some cases, contractors have a ton of power differential over people and you wouldn't want them to be taking advantage. I see your point and I'm just wondering about um, some, pro some process that's built in for like uh, disclosure that would not make you subject to this. Like I'm married to somebody and I, um, I mean, one, they obviously wouldn't put you in any kind of role related to your partner, but um, but having that be an opt-in rather than do away with, and maybe you weren't saying do away with, um, but I was worried about people out in the community too, somehow being pressured to do stuff because they were still under pressure from corrections and not wanting to ignore their protection. Yeah, I, uh, hello. I, <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate, and, and I appreciate the intention and I, I agree with you, right? If we, we think about this, it, it would be very easy to say, even as a contractor, do what I want you to do, or I'm gonna tell your PO, right? I'm gonna tell the person supervising you, I'm going to uh, create a, a, a narrative so you are reincarcerated, right? That's the power differential right. we're talking about. And I think the piece that's missed often, and it's a lot of to what I testified yesterday in-house corrections is really about, we're doing a lot of employee heavy addressing these recommendations. We're doing a lot of focus on the staff, the employees, the contractors. And my viewpoint is always to talk about the unintended consequences for the very folks we're trying to protect, right? Like that's something we just heard in testimony about hate crime work is around, how do we also not further harm the very people we are trying to protect? Right. And so I right. think that whether we build in a mechanism somehow to address this, it has to be addressed. That's a lot of people, that is thousands of people who could start a new relationship. You might be a contractor in a male identified facility in Newport and start dating uh, someone who's under supervision in Burlington, but it's you guys met at like a coffee shop. Right, that we're trying to address coercion, exploitation, power right. and control, but we have to have this, there is no language in here that addresses sort of any of the, the consensual piece or healthy pieces right. or folks like myself. And if this were a um, client-centric bill, um, would you see it looking different? And by client, maybe that's not the right word, but I prefer to use that than... Yeah, inmate or, you know, 
I, I appreciate the the use of language. Uh, I try to not to use the word inmate as well. Um, so I would say again, I I think there would be language in here specific to some of those. I, there are so many barriers for those of us trying to reintegrate into society. Right. There, I mean, um, and and in building relationships. And I just think about all of the contractors corrections works with and that the courts work with. And then I think of all of, you know, right. to say that you can never engage in a relationship with someone and having no specific language to address the other side of that, um, I think will end up being more problematic for the very people we're trying to protect. Right, I, like I you- raise a great point, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Coach and then Kate and Selena. Unmute here. Uh, Ashley, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for testifying uh, as always. Um, my question is, has your group um, considered any uh, language in regards to um, that section uh, that you'd like to uh, have us at least look at? I think we would be uh, happy uh, to provide some thoughts on language and, and work with um, the committee or, or House Corrections if that's more appropriate to, to work through how to, how to think this through in a more um, incarcerated person point of view or supervised uh, person point of view. I just really see this as creating well, another barrier. Yeah, for folks, well, well, I can. It, it 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 only makes sense. You know, we have a very large uh, community in our in the Upper Valley, uh, and um, I, I see that potentiality. So um, I would be interested personally, and uh, at least. Um, offering that consideration to Madam Chair, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Coach, and, and that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Let me mute. Uh, Kate, your hand is down. Yeah, I lowered my hand. Uh, Coach, Coach just okay. um, asked the question. Great, okay, thank you. Um, Selena. You're muted. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, Coach, I actually had the same question as Coach and Kate. Um, so really just wanted to, to thank you, Ashley, because I've this question has been kind of forming in the back of my mind. Every time I have looked at this language, I haven't, I have unfortunately missed some of the, the previous committee discussion on it, but um, yeah, we would really appreciate the opportunity to work on just getting us closer to our actual intent here with your collaboration. Great, thank you. And uh, Coach, I do see your hand is still up. I just wanna make sure that it's, you're good, okay, great. Okay, well, Ashley, yeah, thank you very much and, and do look forward to working with you more in this. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank, thank yeah. you. Uh, okay, well, it said four o'clock, we have two minutes and we have Matt Valerio here. So if we, could, if we could hear from Matt, since you are here, that would complete our testimony, at least for today. Thank you. Good to see you, Matt. Um, it's good to be here. I will tell you that uh, my testimony in no way will, will uh, be complete in two minutes. Um, I, I know I'm giving you more than two minutes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, but I meant to say it was you're here, so let's let's okay. let's hear from you, please. Well, I'm Matt Valerio, and I'm the Defender General. And I need to give you some background on this so you understand how this came to be. Uh, there was no specific statute on sex, sexual exploitation of an inmate prior to 2005. And I was Defender General during that period of time. And this statute was developed um, and written to comply with United States Supreme Court 
um, restrictions on <clears throat> constitutional restrictions on uh, state interference with personal relationships. Um, and just so that you know a little bit about my background, before I was Defender General, I was in private practice from the late 80s until uh, I became Defender General in 2001. And during that period of time, um, I, rep I represented many people who were charged with sex crimes um, as a private attorney, but I also represented um, many corrections officers who were charged uh, in either with uh, having uh, sexual relationships with inmates um, in, uh, from a, uh, uh, in their employment cases that were brought by the Department of Corrections. Um, and I also represented victims of um, sexual assault who had been forcibly uh, assaulted by corrections officers um, bring civil lawsuits against the Department of Corrections to, uh, um, to get them uh, uh, made whole as best as you could under those kind of terrible circumstances. So as a practical matter, at one time or another, prior to becoming Defender General, I had represented all sides of this issue in different venues. I've seen this for a very long time in a lot of different areas. Um, prior to 2005, if there was an, a criminal uh, case brought against a corrections officer, it would be under the same standard as any sort of uh, sexual assault or sexual misconduct. Um, so, you know, lewd and lascivious conduct um, or um, uh, sexual assault, uh, you know, forcible or otherwise. Um, and, uh, and, that's how, and that's how it was handled. Uh, there came a point, however, um, where there was a recognition, as we did with other professions um, that have a power imbalance, that it was necessary to do a statute, create a statute that recognized that that power imbalance um, was real and needed a, a criminal response. That having been said, so it, it, there, you have to look at the circumstances where these things arise. Obviously, within a correctional facility, there couldn't be a probably larger power imbalance um, between an individual and a corrections officer that you could possibly imagine. They control 24 seven, um, pretty much everything that you uh, possibly can do. Um, but here's where the rub came in and it was with subsection two, people who are on supervision, no matter what you call it, um, whether it's probation, parole, supervised community sentence, furlough, or, or whatever we're, we might call it in the future. We go all the way back to, there's a famous case, Griswold versus Connecticut, um, which was one of the early uh, contraception cases um, that for you know those of you who have paid attention to that and one of the precursors to the Roe versus Wade case, which recognized that the, that uh, uh, Americans have a protected liberty interest, a constitutional liberty interest in a right to association and particularly in their right to intimate relationships with whoever they want to have intimate relationships with and that the government can't get into your intimate relationships and tell you what is right or wrong, whether it has to do with contraception or um, same-sex relationships or the like as it's developed over the years. Um, so for the state to impair your right to have um, this right of association, this right of an intimate relationship, the state has to have a compelling interest, not just a rational basis or, or a, a reason that's sort of good. It has to be a compelling interest. And when the state acts in that area, whatever limitation they put on it has to be the least restrictive means available to satisfy that compelling state interest. So the state has no interest in regulating regular se sexual relationships, you know, between consulted, consenting adults. 
Does it have an interest in regulating sexual um, conduct between inmates and corrections officers? Of course it does. It has a heightened interest when somebody is actually incarcerated. Does it have an interest in relationships where the person is under supervision? But, and so the, I think the answer to that is yes, it has an interest. Um, but if that person is not under the direct supervision um, of an individual, um, we have to make sure that we tailor the state intervention in a way that is the least restrictive possible that still gets at the issue. And so what the statute was drafted about was to get at the supervisor supervisee relationship, as you can see, um, and, and understand that there are relationships that are going to exist as the um, prior witness talked about where it's husband and wife, um, where you're going to have somebody who works for the Department of Corrections and somebody who is under supervision um, that uh, would not be, we wouldn't want to term them as criminal and the state wouldn't have an interest in terming them as criminal um, as a result of that relationship. Let me go a little bit further and recall for you some of the testimony that went on in 2005 when this was passed. Um, at that time, we were coming out of a period of time when one in five males under the age of 25 years old were under the supervision in Vermont of the Department of Corrections. Um, and they were basically on probation, the vast majority of them, for uh, possession of malt beverage crimes that occurred when they were 16 years of age or older. Um, and they had failed to uh, complete the crash course. So they ended up on probation um, pretty much indefinitely. Now at that time, this was prior to Justice Reinvestment One. Um, we had almost 20,000 people either incarcerated or under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. And we reduced that number after that. But in the in context, you almost couldn't go anywhere and, and uh, where there was a group of males and not find somebody who wasn't under the um, supervision of the Department of Corrections. Um, so it would not be unusual to have somebody who came up from uh, Bennington and uh, you know perhaps got a DUI and ended up under supervision for, uh, uh, for that offense um, being related to somebody who was working for the Department of Corrections in some capacity. Uh, at that time, we had a number of people come and testify and talk about like, how can, this is untenable. And it's not a matter of whether you're married or not married. Um, the whole uh, constitutional issue of um, the right of association and the right to a, a relationship is not based upon marriage. So it, it could be a, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend relate, relationship or dating relationship of any variety. Um, and as a result, this was crafted at the time to try to best as it could take into account um, individuals who we know exist in society who would be subject to um, a five year felony criminal offense um, only by virtue of their status as opposed to um, any kind of power imbalance. Uh, because this is not a, uh, this is a, what we would call a strict liability crime. Um, if you fit the status, you are um, subject to a five-year felony. So this portion um, was, which is sought to be struck, was carefully crafted to make sure that it met constitutional muster and it, and it recognized that there are going to be a lot of individuals um, who have relationships with people um, who work for the Department of Corrections who may be under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. And at the time, VSEA came in um, and individuals from the Department of Corrections and testified very similarly to the prior witness um, that it would be problematic if this were 
a mere strict liability offense for somebody being on probation or in supervision of the Department of Corrections engaging in a sexual act or a sexual relationship with somebody who worked for corrections. Um, it, uh, so we, we don't support the bill um, because we, I know where it came from, number one. Um, and while the, you turned up and there, it was turned up during the seven days uh, um, articles and in the Downs Rackman Martin report that there was clearly um, uh, inappropriate relationships with people who were on, who were, had been released either on furlough or um, on probation or at parole. Um, to me, the issue was not this statute. The issue was the lack of enforcement <laughs> um, prior, you know, dur during that period of period of time, uh, because they were exercising a co coercion um, to gain a, a sexual advantage, um, and uh, uh, it's so the the statute itself to me was not the the biggest problem. I also just as a caveat let you know how extensive. Um, this protection under uh, the First Amendment liberty interest is um, this right of association. Now we, we all know about, you know, we're much more uh, knowledgeable about um, sexual relationships in the workplace, sexual harassment, um, and, and in general sexual relationships. One of the most protected areas of employment law, and I've come across this many times as Defender General with um, individuals who work for the uh, um, Defender General's office, both as contractors and as employees. Um, if some, if I have individuals in an office who are engaging in a sexual relationships contrary even to the policy, I can't fire those people. But, but what I can't do is leave them in a position where you have a supervisor and a supervisee, so to speak. Um, I can't leave them in that. So I have to transfer one of them out to another office so they are not subject to the control or the potential control um, of, of a supervisor or the like. Um, it is uh, not that I would wanna fire people generally under those circumstances, but it can clearly cause problems in an office environment. But, but just so that you understand, on the civil side of it, those are folks that we have. To, I have to make accommodations for, um, who are not um, engaging in anything criminal or even against a, a statute in in Vermont. Um, they, but they have protection of their employment rights under this concept. You don't go the next step and say, is that kind of conduct criminal? Um, and you, you get to an even heightened level of scrutiny um, where you have to be very careful about what you are prohibiting so as not to sweep in. And I, and I think the prior witness um, maybe used the wrong, you know, the wrong term. This isn't vague, but this is, is overly broad if you are going to um, eliminate this section. What this section does is focus it down to the group that you're really trying to get at, understanding that there's nothing that is going to be 100% perfect um, to, to satisfy every situation. And I think that's about all that I can, I, I would hope to tell you right now. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Kate. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I'm just curious, like, so I'm, I'm looking at the, the language of the bill, um, I guess as it is currently, and it, it refers to um, being on someone's caseload, sort of as the way of like narrowing the focus. And I'm just trying to imagine a scenario that seems like relatively likely to me where you might have someone on probation or parole, and there's a they are having um, another probation officer within the office that they're receiving probation from um, starts to 
make sexual advances on that person. So it's not, it's not their probation officer. They're not on this person's caseload, but it's someone within the office that manages their probation. And, and so it seems like the current language would not provide any protection for that person. And I'm just sort of, so I guess I'm, I'm trying to sort of work out some of the conversation we were having with the witness before, just ha- how to, to me, it's not about whose caseload you're on, it's about consent and the act, that the sort of act itself. And I don't know how you carve language out around that, but, and I don't know if I'm formulating a question exactly. I guess I'm just saying like in the scenario I'm describing would not, that would, would that person receive protection under the law as it's currently written, I guess is the question. I don't, I don't think they would under this, but I think they could under our regular sexual assault statutes and, um, and you would deal with uh, the, proof of, the proof of coercion um, by virtue of their uh, position. Um, the, remember that there, is, there are a number of ways to skin this cat, so to speak. Uh, you can, someone, as they did in the past, could always be charged under other sexual assault um, or sexual misconduct statutes. Um, the other thing about this is that it doesn't, just because it's not a crime doesn't mean there's not a consequence. So you may lose your job. And that was part of what, you know, back in, you know, 25 years ago when I was doing that kind of work, representing individuals in the Department of Corrections who would have relationships with uh, um inmates or, or offenders who are out on uh, probation or parole. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a job consequence as well uh, to that, even if it was a completely consensual uh, situation. So, you know, sometimes it's not the criminal law that is going to solve your problems, but, uh, but other um, statutes and uh, even the collective bargaining agreement that is work, has been worked out uh, between the department and its uh, employees. You know, I, you. I, I don't. I just don't know that the the five year, given, given the amount of this that had had gone on, even with the statute in place, um, I don't see there being a deterrent effect. It's more about what happens after the fact. Um, okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. No problem. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, sure. Okay, everybody. So thank you for hanging in there. Uh, could adjourn and uh, go off.